Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our third covenant Sunday service in Jesus' name. A covenant is like a covenant of marriage between the bride and the bridegroom. And as they come together in that covenant made on a particular day, then they continue bride and bridegroom, bridegroom and bride, all the days of their lives until death do them part. In the case of God, he does not die. Our God does not die. Our bridegroom does not die. And as the bride comes in contact with the bridegroom and we're together, we'll be together forever and ever in Jesus' name. And as the bridegroom takes care of the bride, so our bridegroom, our Lord, in this covenant, takes care of us. He'll take care of you. But then we have a journey, the bride and the bridegroom, the bridegroom and the bride, they have a journey from here to the final destination. And I pray that our journey will not be like that of the children of Israel. Up, down, good, bad, positive, negative, up and down. Ours will not be like that in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you today understanding that our journey with you is the journey of the bride with the bridegroom until the glorious day and we're asking oh lord that your strength your grace your power your love will be in us throughout the journey in jesus name we're asking lord that all the ups and downs and the negative and the positive and all the things that happen to the children of israel will not happen to any of us that will live consistently, positively, spiritually, in a practical way, following the Lord and going with the Lord all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Bless us in our Sabbath this morning, here and everywhere we're connected in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Numbers chapter 11. I want to remind you that the children of Israel had left Egypt. And as they left Egypt, they were going to the promised land. In, the, in their journey to the promised land, quite a lot of things happened. And we're studying all this because the scripture has told us that all these things are reaching for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come. We, as we look at them today, in this chapter 11, as well as chapter 12 of Numbers, you see that they began to complain. They began to murmur. And eventually they even began to weep. They began to cry. Oh, give us this and this and that. And their lives became like a life of self pitying all the way through. And it says God was angry with that attitude. He was angry with their murmuring. And it displeased the Lord and also displeased Moses, their leader. Eventually, Moses cried to the Lord. But his cry to the Lord was like saying, O oh Lord, this is tiring. This is despairing. I cannot bear all this alone. Because they were like perpetual babies. Always grumbling, always murmuring, always complaining. God himself was not happy with them. And then God said to 70 men, because he said he couldn't bear all those complaints, all those memories alone by himself. 
choose 70 men that are well known and I'll put my spirit on you I'll put part of that spirit on them and so the 70 were chosen and the spirit of God came upon them so that they could assist Moses in the way in the work the Lord had given and eventually we come to chapter 12 where Miriam, Miriam falls, Miriam and Aaron grumbled, murmured against Moses and God showed that Moses was a man meek, loving, gentle, patient and that he would speak with Moses face to face. Eventually that was dealt with and their journey continued. I pray our journey will continue in Jesus' name. We're looking at Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 16. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men. He wanted those men so that the Spirit of God upon Moses will be upon them. And he said it should be of the elders in Israel, elders of Israel, that whom thou knowest, that is the leaders, the elders, the committed people, that Moses knew, you will know their character. He'll know their lifestyle. He'll know that they will be competent people to represent all the tribes and all the various sections of the people of Israel. And he, he mentioned 70 in particular of the elders of Israel whom thou knowest. And then he said to be the elders of the people, elders of the people, and then he said that they will bear the burden with him. Look at verse 17, and I will come down and put, and I will put the spirit on thee upon them, so that they'll be able to bear the burden with thee. Today we're looking at the new anointing for sons, for servants, the 70 people, 70 elders, they represented the sons and the servants of God today in the new covenant. As we come to understand the covenant we have with God, the sons and daughters of God and the servants of God, members of the body of Christ and ministers in particular, represented by these 17. And Moses, of course, represented uh, representing our Lord. The spirit upon him, the glory upon him, the power upon him, the utterance and the unction and the anointing upon him. He wants to give the sons and the daughters today. And as he gives us, as he makes us to have a spirit, then we're able to bear the body, we're able to uh, fulfill the great commission, we're able to do what Christ would have been done, if Christ would have been doing, if Christ were here today. As I said, I'm talking to you on the new anointing. For this new year, we need a new anointing, a new power, a new unction. And we need that new power so that every yoke in us, in our family, and everywhere will break every one of them in Jesus' name. But the anointing is for sons, for daughters. The anointing is for the servants of God. The people who know that they have come to the Lord, they are not Egyptian slaves. They are Emmanuel's sons and daughters. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. He has taken us out of the darkness of the world. He has brought us into the light of the gospel. And because of that, faith in him has made us sons and daughters in the Lord. Not only that, we are also servants of God. He calls us 
and he sends us forth to do what pleases him. Anointing, the new anointing for the sons and the servants in the new covenant. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the protection and security from the anger of the Lord. Those Israelites were not all wise. And they were not all diligent in keeping themselves under the umbrella of the goodness of God, the protection of the Lord. The pillar of cloud followed them, the pillar of fire followed them, so that they'll have total, complete, irreversible protection from the Lord. But they were not all wise and they killed upon themselves the anger of the Lord. But as we go in our journey, He wants us fully protected, He wants us totally secured from the anger of the Lord. Point number one protection and security from the anger of the Lord. Number two, putting the spirit on the 70 assistants in labor. They were to labor with Moses. They were to labor with the leader God had chosen to take them to the promised land. And they needed the same spirit, the same anointing, and the same power to be upon them so that they'll do the same thing, they walk the same way, they go in the same direction, and they have the same labor with Moses, their leader. Point number two, putting the spirit on the 70 assistants in labor. Point number three, pouring out the spirit on sons with anointing from the Lord. Pouring out the spirit, the spirit that comes with anointing that is poured out upon them and it is for a purpose it is for a reason that they will be able to do the work of the lord let's come to point number one point number one we're looking at protection and security from the anger of the lord we're looking at numbers chapter 11 and we're reading here from verse one numbers chapter 11 and we're looking at uh, verse 1 it says uh, that uh, this and when it says and it's a connection it's a conjunction it's connecting with the previous uh, chapter you know what at that point the previous chapter they had observed the Passover they had invited the father-in-law of Moses that it shall go along with them and we'll study that and it says now and after all that and after the uh, Passover after remembering that we came out of Egypt after remembering uh, that we came out so that we can go in we go through the wilderness we're not supposed to stay and to remain and abide in the wilderness it says and after we remember our coming out our going through so we can get in and this now happened it says the people complained and they, and they did this they despised the Lord and they despised and the Lord heard it. They despised the Lord. They despised the way they were going in the journey. They despised the manner, the food they had been given. And they belittled that. They despised that. They looked down that. The gift of God for them, the bread of heaven given to the people on earth, they despised that. The way to do that, you look at what the Lord had given you. You look at what the Lord had been doing. He saved your soul. It's provided for you. It's giving you healing. It's healed your sick body. It's done everything that ought to be done that could be done. He has fulfilled this promise in your life. 
Are you despising that he gives you opportunity to minister eh, on his behalf? Are you despising that? Are you going your own way after he had done such a great and wonderful thing in your life? They despise the goodness of God, the blessing of God, the miracles of God, bread coming from heaven to feed them all that they despise. And it displeased the Lord. Anytime we grumble, anytime we murmur, anytime we belittle what the Lord has given us and what He has done in our lives, anytime we belittle that, is offended, is grieved, is displeased. And in your life, if in the old year, in the past, in the year that passed, every time a little inconvenience, a little problem, a little challenge, what comes out of your mouth is grumbling, murmuring, despising, criticizing, that displeases the Lord. In fact, it says, as we look at uh, verse 4, it goes on to say that they did it only despise what the Lord had given them, that they even wept. The mixed multitude, that's those people that have come with them out of Egypt, but Egypt did not come out of them. The people that have joined, but they had not been transformed. Their lives have not been turned around. They also, the mixed multitude, they began to complain. They began to murmur. Days, days, and days. They would always find something. Mixed multitude. Backsliding people. People that are not totally transformed and not totally changed and giving to the Lord. They will always find something to murmur about and something to criticize. And by the way, they were criticizing something greater than what they ever got in Egypt. This is the bread that came from heaven. And yet, they had to murmur about that. I pray that this year, from today, for the rest of our lives, the Lord will cure us from the disease of murmuring in Jesus' name. Wipe everything so that uh, we don't have to murmur. If there's a need, we can call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here is a need. If we need, uh, you know, something to eat or something to live by, we can easily call upon the Lord. Oh, Lord, do this for me. Do this for us. He will do it in Jesus' name. Those who walk by faith never complain. Those who walk by faith never murmur. Those who walk by faith, they never grumble. The people that grumble, the people that find fault, and the people that say, what are we doing with this? And they despise and be, they belittle you. The blessing of God, those are the people that cannot pray. Those are the people that bring all their problems, all their issues on Moses, on the pastor, on their leader, or they bring it upon an apostle and they say about this well the promise belongs to you you can preach you and the blessing has been promised you can call upon the Lord the people who murmur and the people who grumble they do not pray they do not have faith in God all they want is for another person to solve their problem for them and they wept you know sometimes there are people that think weeping is the answer no not at all if you you are weeping because you are unhappy. You are weeping because you are pitying yourself. You are weeping because you don't have faith in God. That displeases God. The weeping of unbelief. The weeping of uh, self-pity and the weeping of not having faith in God to do uh, and to ask and to have what the Lord has provided. That weeping does not please the Lord. In fact, the Lord challenged the children of Israel in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2 verse 13. What was he challenging them on? What were they doing that displeased him? That he said that they were just like the generations behind. And what do we do today that displeases the Lord that shows that we're well, like the unbelieving bunch, the unbelieving Israelites that passed through the wilderness and they were crying and crying like babies for every little thing in Malachi chapter 2, looking at verse 13 there, it says, and this 
have ye done this? Have ye done? He was telling them that they were covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping. You know, some people, they take that as a habit. They're coming before the Lord and they're weeping and weeping and weeping. Now, think about that. If you are a child at home and every time you want to ask mommy for breakfast, you have to start with weeping. You want to ask daddy for school fees, you have to start with weeping. You want to ask your parents for what they have promised. And they said, this is what we are going to do. And every time you come before them, you have to start by weeping. That's a bad habit. And that is the habit of a slave. They do not know they deserve anything. They do not know they deserve the blessings of the Lord. All they can do is weep, weep, weep. And if that has been, you know, your, your lifestyle, you complain, you weep, you murmur, you weep, you, uh, you kind of uh, speak against God, you weep and you speak against the church and you weep, that should not be the lifestyle of a real child of God. A real child of God will come with faith and faith has some joy and faith has some excitement and faith has some expectation from the Lord that you are saying, oh Lord, do this for me because you are promised. Do this for me because you are faithful. Do this for me because you are God and you cannot lie and your promises are yes and amen. But these people, they offended the Lord by complaining, by murmuring by criticizing and then we come to Numbers chapter 12 you know the story already is about Miriam and about Aaron and the two of them now you wonder why it is at this time now they are complaining or murmuring about the marriage of Moses hey Moses had married before coming back from the wilderness and from before showing up before Pharaoh he had married and even got a children and when they were coming on the way the Lord confronted him because the, the child had not been circumcised eventually one of the sons who had not been circumcised he was circumcised and the Lord let him go and he came in the fullness of the power of God when he appeared before Pharaoh and said let my people go he was married and yet the might did not hinder the plan and the power of God he manifested power they didn't they know him at that time didn't they see the wife at that time and then all the miracles that took place all those things that are taking place Miriam where were you and Aaron where were you is it at this time now will dig up something about Moses and then they cross the Red Sea and we know that Miriam took the tambourine and, and uh, you know danced and was happy and he said God is glorious he has glorious defeated all their enemies but Moses was married then and you all rejoice and they came uh, to Exodus chapter 16 and the manna came down for them and they all ate Moses was married then why is it at this late hour they are now talking about and Moses married an Ethiopian woman for she had married an Ethiopian woman and eventually uh, they got to chapter 17 of Exodus he was married then they had no water to drink and God said strike that rock and he struck the rock and water came out and millions of people drank the miracle water why he said they didn't complain then but now at this time very near the end of their lives because now Miriam was beyond 130 years of age 12 years older than Moses and the Aaron beyond about um, 123 why is it at this late hour 
between them and the grave. And before they left this world, they started this grumbling business and this murmuring business and this criticism against the man of God, against Moses. But Moses did not chide with them. He was younger than Miriam and Aaron. He was the last of the three. But the Lord heard. When we grumble against leadership, God hears. When we grumble against the man of God, God hears. When we grumble against our pastor, God hears. And when we follow up the grumbling by influencing other people to also grumble, God hears. And God came down and said, he called them and he said, why are you murmuring? If there's any man among you, anyone among you that says, my servant is this Moses, is the meekest of all men. After rebuking them, he went away and Mary became leprous and Aaron looked at, uh, looked at her they were accomplices together and it was, the, it was the duty of Aaron as the high priest to take Miriam and to make her go outside the camp how do you like the person you have committed the same sin with become a leper and you are the one to take care of that and both of them had the anger and the judgment of God and it's because of the prayer of Moses that they were eventually let loose or let go from that murmuring. I pray that the Lord will deliver us from the murmuring that took place at that time in Jesus name. And you have to make up your mind. You know if there's no listening ear you know the tongue will stop wagging. If somebody comes to you and he complains and he murmurs and he criticizes, he doesn't see anything good happening. Only people are giving testimony. God is blessing us and God is saving souls and God is delivering people. And many people do not see anything that to glorify God for. And then they come to you and say, do you know? Did you hear? Did you see? If you keep listening here, then you'll be part of the murmuring. I will not be part of their murmuring. I will not be part of their murmuring. And, and you know when somebody has uh, given himself to murmuring behind, you see when they come to the public, they cannot serve the Lord like they used to serve the Lord. There is something pinching them. There is something troubling them. There is something they are complaining about. There is something they are trying to tear apart. They say, I'm not happy with that. I'm, when somebody is not happy, you can tell. When somebody is grumbling, you can tell. When somebody is picking holes in the ministry, when somebody is uh, denigrating and belittling and, and complaining and criticizing, you can tell by their outward expression. If they were doing something for the Lord before and they were doing that excitedly and happily and cheerfully. When grumbling takes hold of them when they come to the public you can tell the cheerfulness is no more there, the happiness is no more there, the gladness is no more there, the, the excitement of serving the Lord is no more there they are grinding something they are complaining about something they are having in their heart some Peter, Peter, and Vin. That the reason why, but if you come, or if that has happened, why don't you come back to the Lord? Like Aaron apologized and said, We have seen. We said what was not right. After all, what they were complaining about, about marriage, about uh, Ethiopian woman, God did not complain about that. Are you more perfect than God? Are you holier? than God? Do you have a standard higher than God? What God has not complained about, what are you complaining about? And so they solved the problem, but it led a mark on Moses because Moses now said, oh God, you've seen it yourself. The murmuring of the people, the complaining of the people, you've seen it yourself. What am I going to do now? How can I bear the weight 
the load so heavy of these people all alone by myself and, and they're also asking for meat am i going how am i going to find meat for all these people and god said leave that with me i will provide the meat all our problems we can live with god he'll provide everything in jesus name i come to point number two here point number two is putting the spirit on the 70 assistance in labor they were to assist him that is assist moses the man of god in labor these 70 and the Lord said he will be the one to choose them. He will look at their qualification. They will hate covetousness. He will look at their qualification. They will not be place position seekers. He will look at their qualification. They will be people that want to serve. Not the people that want to get anything out of their service. But the people that will really want to serve the people. And they want to serve at all times. And serve in all things. And whatever was committed into their hands. They will be willing to serve in whatever it is. And so he chose the 70 men that love the truth men that hate covetousness and men that will not join any clique any class of murmurers that will not join any class or any group of complainers and when they were chosen they were brought before the lord and the spirit came upon them because god had said i will come and put the spirit on you and put that spirit on them and so the spirit came upon them there were two of them midad and elder elder and midad they didn't come to the tabernacle they didn't come uh, to the place where the other 68 were the spirit of god came upon the 68 and he prophesied and Midad and elder, the Spirit of God also came upon them and they prophesied likewise. Why? Because they were not away because they had anything against their leader. It just happened circumstantially that those two were not in the tabernacle. And the Spirit of God, the Lord who knew their heart, pardoned heart, a pure heart, a sanctified heart, a free heart, a heart that is totally yielded unto the Lord. The Spirit of God came upon them all the same. Today we have the promise of the Lord that the promise of the Father, that he is the Holy Ghost, will be sent unto us. He will baptize. He has saved you. He has sanctified you. He comes with the immersion in the Spirit of God. Baptism in the Spirit of God. Immersion in the power of the Lord. And as we are saved and we're free from external sin, outward sin, and then we're sanctified, and the inbred nature the Lord has taken care of. And there is no secret memory. There's no secret complaining there's no secret uh, uh, criticism everything within transparent before the lord he brings the spirit upon us now understand among these 70 there were no people none of them that just occupied position the many people they don't have the spirit of god the many people they do not even have the holiness and sanctification which is the will of god for everyone there are many people they do not have the anointing the unction and their lives are dry and their lives are shallow and they still keep the position all they want is I am one of the 70 I am one of the significant leaders are you truly saved are you free from sin? Are you free from cutting our leaders behind 
the sin? Are you free from all the criticism and all the murmuring and complaining of the multitude, of the mixed multitude? Or are you just, you know, I have position, I have this, I have that. But your life is not pure. But these were purified people. These were sanctified people. These were people that the blood of the Lamb had cleansed them and purged them. And now they were able to have the baptism or the immersion or the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Those in the camp and those outside the camp. And uh, that shows that when you are in, in the church here, you pray with all your heart. Would you pray with all the faith you have and you say, I want the Spirit of God. I want to teach in the baptism and measure. The promise that God had given to, to, through joy up to what I'll pour of my spirit upon all flesh and upon the men and the women, upon the handmaids and the servants. I'll pour my spirit upon those days and they shall prophesy. You want to tell the Lord, you want to really pray from your heart or maybe you are not here in the in the church in the camp but you are at home like elder and me that you want to surrender yourself to the Lord you're not being pulled here and there that you cannot concentrate in prayer you cannot have importunity in prayer you pray unto the Lord and then the same spirit the same power the same anointing the same unction that he gives the people here within the church he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost He'll baptize you with power and you can tell the same evidence that the people in the in the camp the same evidence they had they prophesied and they prophesied and they will not cease the same evidence these people had in you know in their houses because it says they prophesied and they would not cease i pray that the evidence of the presence and the power the unction the anointing of the holy ghost will be upon all our lives in Jesus' name. A year of the power of the Holy Ghost. A year of anointing in the Holy Ghost. A year of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost according to His promise upon every one of us in Jesus' name. He'll do it in all, all our lives. You remember the promise of the Lord that he had given, and you remember the fulfillment of that promise uh, upon them, and the same thing upon us today. But what does that take? What does it take for you to have the same outpouring? Now, if you're going to have the same outpouring of the Spirit of God on Moses, you must have the consecration like that of Moses, that gave up everything that said he'll follow the Lord and he followed the Lord and did everything as the Father as God had commanded him. If you're going to have a similar spirit, unction, anointing, power upon your life, you must also have the same purpose he had in mind because he had the purpose that he'll honor God and whether it was before Pharaoh or before Korah, Dishan and Abiram or before any of the children of Israel, he didn't chicken out, out of fear that well, these people I don't want them to do this or do this even when, when uh, Pharaoh said, you will not see my face again and threaten him, he endured as seeing him that is invisible. If you're going to do the same work of the 70 with Moses, if you're going to have the same power like the 70, if you're going to have the same labor and the same unction like the 70, if you're going to have the same work to do with Moses, then you have to have the same commitment to the Lord, the same consecration to the Lord, and the same abandonment unto the Lord. That's what they had. That's how they lived. That's what they did. That's how the power, the anointing, the unction came upon them. They were not, you know, there, any of those 70, to do something contrary to Moses, to do something different from what Moses was doing. If you, this year, you should align your purpose, your plan, 
your action, your activity, align that with the leader God has given us. So that we're saying the same thing. Amen. We're doing the same thing. Amen. We're going in the same direction. Amen. We have the same mind that we're going to follow the Lord and we're going to do what the Lord himself has appointed. Not that Moses is going this direction, but you want the Spirit of God so you can go a different direction. Not that Moses is emphasizing this for all the children of Israel. And you want the Spirit of God so you can emphasize something in a different a critical spirit will not have the Holy Ghost upon him like the leadership has. But when you have the same mind, the same sign, the same vision, the same passion, the same direction, and the same thing you are holding, then the Lord will put that spirit upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Put in the spirit upon the seventy now. It's easy for anyone to claim, I have the spirit. We we'll have to ask the 70, what were they doing after they received the spirit? Did they know the purpose for which they were given the spirit? Did they have, the, were they engaged in the same labor that Moses was engaged in by having the spirit? And when we to ask ourselves, if you say you have the Holy Spirit, if you say you have the Holy Ghost, if you say you have the same power, what are you doing? Are you evangelizing? Are you fulfilling the great commission? Are you going the way of the Lord? Are you teaching the word of God? And are you teaching the same word of God that transforms life? that changes life and that makes people to live and to walk the way they ought to walk. Are you in secret and in the open doing the same work or are you somehow, somehow, somehow working against the progress of the kingdom and the progress of preaching the gospel and the progress of the preachers of the gospel. While you say you have the spirit of God, that's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God will do the same thing that those apostles were doing, will do the same thing that Christ has commanded. This is what to do. There will be no contrary action. There will be no contrary utterance. There will be no contrary behavior. There will be nothing in the night or in the day that will contradict what God has ordained that the church should do. He said, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And that's the commission he has given us. That's how we need the Spirit of God. He shall see power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Are you doing that? You claim to be saved? Are you telling others how to be saved? You claim to be sanctified? Are you upholding the standard of sanctification? Are you encouraging all the people to be sanctified? And when they come to the presence of God, are you busy encouraging others and praying with others and interceding for others that they too will have this holiness without which no man shall save the Lord and this sanctification that you say you have God, you say you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, are you doing what the Lord baptized you for? Are you busy on other things negative, other things unproductive, other things hindering the church, other things hindering Moses from accomplishing? Are you part of the contributors to the people that make Moses to say, Lord, this is heavy. Lord, this is overbearing. Lord, this is overwhelming. I cannot bear this. Now, that was before they received that Holy Ghost upon them. If after you claim, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're still part of that crowd, part of that bunch that discourages leadership. That leadership will say, how can I do this? This is overwhelming. Obviously, you don't have the same spirit because you're pulling down. You're oppressing. You're overwhelming rather than helping the leadership to go the direction we ought to go. I pray that this year, things will turn around. 
in our lives, things will turn around. In our disposition, in our action, in our uh, bearing the load and bearing the body with the leadership, things will turn around in Jesus' name. Number one is the protection and uh, security from uh, the anger of the Lord. Number two is uh, the putting uh, the spirit on uh, the 70 assistants in labor. Assistants in uh, labor. Number three is pouring uh, out the spirit on sons with anointing uh, from uh, the Lord. The spirit does not just come uh, alone. It comes with power. It comes with unction. It comes with anointing. And the spirit the Lord puts on us is to work, is to serve, is to do what others who have gone before us, what they have done. What Moses had done by having the spirit upon him. And what others have done in fulfilling the great commission because the spirit of the Lord was upon them. The same thing he calls us to today. He saves us so that first of all, he'll get us out of Egypt, we'll pass over from death unto life. He saves us so that we can say that Christ died for us and the benefit of that death of Christ we already possess, we already have, we have a new life in your heart, in your nature. And if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. The places we used to go, we go there no more. And the bad songs of the world we used to sing, we sing them no more. And the anger we used to have, and we did everything, even in the presence of God, we did everything with anger, with jealousy, with a murmuring spirit. Now we are born again, and we are born again. We become the sons of God, the daughters of God. We come out from among them. All that anger, all that envy, all that jealousy, all that criticism, we don't have anymore. I don't have any more. I don't have any more. We must start from that point of conversion, that point of transformation, that point of being a new creature before we come into covenant with the Lord. And as we come like that, and it saves us, and it forgives us, and it cleanses us, and it changes our lives. It washes away, it blots away all the filthiness of the world that had been in our lives before. And then, not only that, I've said, I'll sprinkle clean water upon them, and they shall be clean. Then he said, I will take away from them the heart of stone. And I will give them the heart of flesh. That means there is an experience that takes away that adamant stony heart, that rebellious stony heart, and that rigid stony heart takes that away from us. He sanctifies us. He purges us from the inside. And the, even though we left Egypt, the Egypt in us, he takes that away. And now we're sanctified. And after that he said, and I will put my spirit within them. My spirit within them. And that's exactly what promise were given. I indeed baptize so with water unto, repen unto uh, repentance. But it's one here mightier than I, greater than I, that is being with God eternally before I was even conceived. And he said, he shall baptize you, immerse you with the Holy Ghost and with power. And that promise is still ours today. That's why when Paul got to Ephesus and he saw those 12 disciples, he didn't wonder about their salvation. He could see that was, they were saved about their sanctification. He didn't ask any question about that. He knew they were sanctified. He didn't see the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the thing you find among unsanctified people, on who 
lonely people. He didn't find that, but he found they were powerless. He found there was no anointing there. He knew there was no freshness of the outpouring of the Spirit of God there. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the Lord is asking us the same question. And the leaders are asking us the same question. I'm asking you know, the same question. Saved, praise the Lord. Sanctified, praise the Lord. But the question now that comes to you is, have you received the Holy Ghost? Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Have you been immersed in the Holy Ghost? Do you have the unction, the anointing, the power of the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost in the baptismal measure? Since you believed, I'm not asking whether you are a worker or not. Have you received the Holy Ghost? I'm not asking whether you know the doctrine or not. I'm asking, have you received the Holy Ghost? I'm not asking whether uh, you know that, you know, the three Christian experiences, one, two, three, salvation, temptation, and Holy Ghost baptism, I'm asking you whether you are a partaker, whether you are a possessor of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Since you believe, and when you have the Holy Ghost according to the promise of the Lord, there will be evidence Moses had the Holy Ghost. And you know what happened? He was so bold before Pharaoh, and then he was able to do all those miraculous things, and even among the children of Israel, he did what no other person could have done in their natural power. Joshua had the Holy Ghost in him because Moses had laid hands on him and received the Holy Ghost. Wasn't he the one that said, son, stop there until I finish this battle? David had the Holy Ghost and you see what David did by the power of the Lord. And you see all those songs and all those psalms that he composed that are still useful and inspiring today. Have you got the Holy Ghost in Elijah and the Holy Ghost and can see the fire. You can see the fervency. You can see the great thing, definite things that were done. Elijah and the Holy Ghost. Have you got the Holy Ghost? You can see even the even the sons of the prophets. They said the spirit of Elijah is come upon Elisha. Have you got the Holy Ghost? Daniel and the Holy Ghost and those Babylonians testified that he had the spirits of the gods with him. And Micah at the Holy Ghost, he said, I'm full of the power of the Spirit of God to declare unto Israel their transgression and their sin. When you have the Holy Ghost, there will be an evidence. John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost, and you can see he turned many from unrighteousness to righteousness. Peter at the Holy Ghost and his preach on that day of Pentecost, and we're told that 3,000 people came to the Lord. They are apostles and the Holy Ghost and it said they preach the word with boldness stealing at the Holy Ghost and the many makers were done through his son and they could not confront him or receive the Holy Ghost power in his life. Philip had the Holy Ghost they went to Samaria and when he was in Samaria, see the great things that were done there, there was great joy in that city. Paul the apostle had the Holy Ghost, he went everywhere in the power of the Holy Ghost. The question is, have you got the Holy Ghost? If you're going to be part of the people that will help and assist in the work of the kingdom at this time, we must have the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and to your children and to many that are far off, as many as our God shall call. He has called you to salvation. He has called you to sanctification. He has called you. He has called you to service and as you respond to that call and you say, yes, I want the Holy Ghost. I want that power upon my life. It's not just that we're praying. We heard about it yesterday, Saturday, workers meeting. We're hearing about it today at the start of the scripture. We're hearing about it now again. It's not the hearing. It's the possessing. It's the partaking of it. It's the having the power of the Holy Ghost in a our lives we will receive. We will receive. And if you're God before, you receive more and more in Jesus' name. And these 70 then were able to help and assist with Moses, the man of God. And today, as you partake, as you possess, as you say, this year I will not remain empty. This year. 
this year, I will not remain empty. The promise of the Father will be fulfilled in your life. The possession of the Holy Ghost will be a reality in your life. And everything your days to do, as it brings you to his service, you'll be able to do in Jesus' name. Can I speak a word to those who shall be part of the seventy? And Moses is looking for you. And Moses is asking of you. You've been there. You're a known person. And you're a dependable person. But when it comes to serving the Lord, you prefer to serve your own interest apart from the interest of the leadership and the interest of the people of God. And when it comes the time to choose those who are known, where is he? Where is she? Your dodge, your hide. And you don't have the anointing, you don't have the unction, you don't even have the desire, and you don't have the desire to join the people of God and bear part of the body. You, you, you see, you see that the standard is going down and the standard is dwindling. You know, if if you wanted to, I could do that, I could do that, I could do that, but where are you? We're looking for you. What are you? Are you dodging? Are you hiding? And do you have the Holy Spirit? Or is the work in the world, the labor in the world so much upon you that early in the morning you are rushing out, no reading Bible, no prayer, no commitment to the Lord. And when we say, we need this, we need this, what are the men, what are the women that you have in possession, the fullness of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God convicts you but the church is so large, you're hiding behind and inside the crowd there. Why don't you say, today I will not hide anymore. I will not hide anymore. I will not hide anymore. There is something to do to help that more people will get saved, more people will be rapturable and the standard will be lifted higher than what we see today. And God has need of you. And you can put in your part, but not without the power and the unction of the Holy Spirit. You're coming today and you say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Use me. Here am I. I am available. All my heart, all my time, all my treasure, all my experience, all my learning, everything I have, I bring. Because if you're going to be part of the 70 that will assist Moses, you must have that same consecration as Moses, that same mind as Moses, and that same purpose of heart as Moses. You're not the one that is just going and coming, going and coming. All you come to do, all you have been coming to do is to time the service. Uh -uh. We don't need the timekeepers. We need the spirit possessors. We need the people that have the spirit of God upon them and they say whatever it takes in a new way. This new year I'm going to serve the Lord. Not the people that want to time the service and they cut short the salvation of those who are to be saved. Not the people that come. All they want to do is to time the service so that the people you need to pray for sanctification and holiness, they don't have the time. Time is up, time is up and they time God in doing whatever he wants to do. You know the people that are devoid and empty of the Holy Spirit and instead of praying all they're looking at is the time they're not ready to prepare for eternity because they say there's no time now. What are you going to do when you get out of the service? If you're time in the service, what are you going to do when the, the responsibilities call? You don't have the power, you don't have the unction. We don't need the timekeepers. We need the Holy Ghost, and we need the possessors of the Holy Ghost. I said we need possessors, partakers of the Holy Ghost. I pray that the Lord will change and stop and um, hinder all those uh, timekeepers in our midst in Jesus' name. That we 
we'll be able to give ourselves completely unto the Lord and say, Lord, I must be immersed in the Holy Ghost. I must be deep totally in the Holy Ghost. I must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I must have the unction, the power. I must have all the anointing that I need to be useful to you this new year. Oh Lord, all the past have been hurrying and hurrying away from the presence of God. All that I dropped this year in Jesus name. He that wait upon the Lord he will strengthen, he will empower. If you wait on the Lord and you say Lord here am I, I need you more of you. I need more of your power, more of your unction and more of the Holy Ghost in my life. He will do it in your life in Jesus name. We're going to rise up now and call upon the name of the Lord. Remember, salvation is very important. Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you just coming and coming? Are you partaking of you know all these messages and everything? And you say the message will go this direction, that direction. But are you saved? Are you born again? Are you free from sin? Are you living a life that is free from criticism? I'm free from all the murmuring. I'm free from all the complaining. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. New year, new life. New year, new covenant. New year, new commitment. New year. And a new giving of yourself unto the Lord without reservation. Open your mouth, talk to the Lord in prayer. I say, Lord, here I am. If the rapture should take place now, are you ready? Free from sin, are you ready? Pardoned, forgiven. You've had the Passover, are you ready? Don't kill any mosquito there, no clapping there. Make yourself ready. Call upon the Lord. Why are you here? To hinder the progress of the church? Why are you here? To stop the passionate prayer of the church? Why are you here? To weigh the leadership, the pastor down, why are you here? To criticize, to murmur, to complain, why are you here? To stop the holiness message, the sanctification message, why are you here? Are you part of the body bearer in the church or part of the body giver? Why are you here? Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Know ye not yourself? Are you a hindrance? Helper, check up. And the oil of the Holy Ghost leaked out in your life. And now you are totally carnal, fleshly, grumbling, complaining, criticizing, critical. Repent. Murmuring, criticism, grumbling, closes the door of heaven against the murmurers and complainers. If the Spirit of God lives in you, it will convict you. That that way is not the way of the Lord. If 
If you're a sinner, you're not an elder. Backslider, you're not an elder. Hindra, you're not an elder. I claim many years I've been there. I just a backslider and continue that way you might miss the land of promise. Judas the thief was numbered among the apostles. He went to the other side even before the Holy Ghost came upon the 120. Who are you? Where are you? Are you part of the mixed multitude? A rigid, carnal, stony heart. Why don't you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I come. But my heart, a repentant heart, Lord, I come. A remorseful heart, Lord, I come. A willing heart, Lord, I come. Praying heart, Lord, I come. You want to change? Lord, I come. He forgives and he sets free. It changes lives. It changes hearts. That the essence of salvation. Hearts changed. Hearts transformed. That's the essence of restoration. The old life gone. The new life evident. Not a plotting Judas among the praying disciples. Table everything before the Lord. Then you say, I came to the service. What's the purpose? What do you possess? What do you have? Does the Spirit bear witness with your spirit that now you are born again? Nobody knows when the rapture will take place. All the time we have to get ready is now. Nobody knows when God will take anyone from the earth. All the time we have to get ready for leaving the earth is now.
Let him save you. And convince everyone around you that your life is different now. That the grace of God has come in your heart. That your life is new. Your actions are new. Your behavior is new. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with your ministers. Follow peace with members of your family. Peace in your heart. No rancor. Peace in your heart. No conflict. Peace in your output, utterances. Follow peace with all men. No arguments, no criticisms. No infighting. Follow peace with all men. And holiness, without which no man, no member, no minister shall see the Lord. And be doers of the word not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Your local church, district church, follow peace with all people there. No using of the scriptures to fight your ministers, to fight the, the scripture teachers, or to fight the leaders who are answering questions. That's not the purpose the scripture was given. Follow peace with all men. The morning devotion, husband and wife, no attacking each other with scripture. That's not the purpose the scripture was given. Follow peace at home. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In your ministry, in your singing, follow peace with the church. The opportunity and privilege of singing is not to attack the minister or to attack the church. If you are doing that, you are not born again. Singing with anger, Bitterness, conflict shows you don't have the supporting spirit to lift up the body now with Moses. You are there to use your ministry to fight. 
follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord you're not using prayer to fight anyone to hinder the progress of the church if you're like that you're just a superficial canal church goer not having salvation follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord if you're in the church as a timekeeper there's nothing like that in the Bible timing the prophecy of the prophets nothing like that timing the preaching of the gospel nothing like that if you are honestly contending for time not for the faith you are not in the will of God. Satan is employing your hands to destroy the church. Honestly, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You are using your gift, you are using your talent. to stop the growth of the church. God has not employed anyone to do that. You are serving the devil if you are doing that. If you are not saved, are you in the service of the Lord? Do yourself a favor to withdraw from the service. Part time, full time, do yourself a service. If you are not born again, you are not saved, you don't have the new life, and you are singing in the choir. You are doing any kind of work in the church, but you are not saved. You are living in secret sin. You are hindering the preaching of the gospel. You are hindering the salvation of sinners. Withdraw. Because that kind of service will not be to your favor. Tell the Lord, I want to have the biblical evidence of salvation and the witness of the Holy Spirit that a real child of God. If you have turned to become a Korah, Dayton, Abiram, a conspiracy against the appointed leader. Why don't you stop, seek the face of the Lord, get regeneration, restoration, coming back into the grace, into the kingdom of God. Are you blindly rushing to perdition and to destruction? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he's near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. For he will pardon, abundantly pardon. And seek for a new heart. This old stony heart will ruin your life, ruin your prospect, destroy your life, scatter your family. You'll hurt yourself more than you hurt others with that stony heart, a carnal heart, that adamant heart, that rigid heart. Seek the Lord for the sanctification experience. That's the will of God. Even your sanctification. Leave everything on the altar. Be a true bride of the bridegroom. Holy, without wrinkle, without blemish, without the marks of the old man. Soft heart, gentle heart, agreeable heart, Pure, purified, purged, give God a chance to take the stony heart away. you receive transformation since you believed have you experienced sanctification since you believed you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire since you believed I see burnt off all the chaff in your life since you believed Are you part of the 70? Part of the sons and daughters who are totally consecrated, committed to the Lord without reservation. How much time is it legitimate to pray? Pray.
seek the Lord, repent of the old sinful habits. Call upon the Lord. He saves. Sanctifies, seek forth the kingdom of God and His righteousness. First, the kingdom of God established in your heart. First, the king of the kingdom in control of your heart first the standard of the kingdom established in your life first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first And then all these things shall be added unto you. Don't put healing first. Kingdom righteousness first. Don't put bread and butter first. Kingdom righteousness first. Don't put earthly material things first. Godliness and righteousness first. The work of grace that qualifies you for heaven first. Don't put added material things first. Are you born again with evidence? Are you sanctified with evidence? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence? Be very sure. Be very sure. This is what will matter. On the final day, when you appear before the presence of God, be very sure. Be very sure. Your salvation holds. Be very sure. Your sanctification holds. Be very sure. Holy Ghost, anointing, unction, power, 
holds in your life. Be very sure your anchor holds. Can you not watch and pray for one hour? You say you love the Lord. Why don't you want to be in the presence of the Lord you love? If you say you are a child of God, why are you tired of being the presence of your father, if it's your real father? Why is the bride avoiding the presence of the bridegroom? Why is the bride not able to wait in the presence of the bridegroom? Where is the love you profess? Where is the joy you profess? Where is the dependence on the bridegroom? Your profess, you are a bride, and you are tired of talking to the bridegroom. Where is your love for the Lord? Where is your reliance upon Him? Who is able to do all things in your life? Prayerlessness betrays us that we do not have a fresh, ongoing relationship with the Lord. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray without weariness. Pray without murmuring or complaining. Pray in His presence. Pray. To have his promise fulfilled in your life. Pray in the church. Pray at home. Pray everywhere. Pray. And make sure you have the promises of heaven fulfilled in your life. Pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Be excited at the opportunity of praying before the Lord. I said in Jesus' name we pray. As we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he says, all these other things shall be added to our lives. Amen. A good amen. amen. A believing amen. amen. Shallow Christians, they turn it around 
they ask for all the other things and they seek the kingdom of God and righteousness will be added. Those are shadow Christians, superficial Christians, Christ-like Christians. They don't believe the words of Christ. The people who believe Christ, the people who receive Christ wholeheartedly, they believe that will pray for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the wage for all the other things to be added unto them. You may go to amen. amen. Kingdom of God, salvation. Kingdom of God, sanctification. Kingdom of God, Holy Ghost baptism. Kingdom of God, righteousness. Kingdom of God, godliness. Kingdom of God, victory over temptation. Kingdom of God, living the purified life. And then once that is settled, all the other things will be added. Amen. 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 The bridegroom desires the purity of the bride before material, material, material things. If you're a good husband, the number one thing you want in your wife, in the bride, is that there should be purity of heart, purity of life, purity of intention, purity of interaction, purity in every, every way. And then after that, because of that purity in the bride, the bridegroom is so happy to give whatever the bride will need. And that's how Jesus acts. He'll put righteousness in your life. Yeah. Raise up your hand as we pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, yeah. thank you, Lord, today because you have revealed your mind. You have not hidden anything from us. You want murmuring grumbling, complaining, envying, jealousy, all those things to be taken away from every one of our lives. Lord, purge everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, from our hearts, there will be no grumbling again. There will be no complaining again. There will be no bitterness again. And there will be no rank or conflict in any heart anymore. In Jesus' name. For those who did not have real salvation. Being born again. Lord, I pray. As they have laid everything on the altar. As they have repented. As they have called upon you. As they have asked for forgiveness and freedom from sin. Oh Lord, I pray. Do a regenerating work of grace in every heart. In Jesus' name. Wash cleanse, wipe all the filthiness of life, all the filthiness of language, all the filthiness in habit, wash everything away in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know you do not want any rigid, carnal, stony, stubborn heart, adamant heart to remain in anyone because that will not be the heart of a true bride of Christ. Therefore, Lord, we pray that everyone that has asked for real sanctification, holiness of heart, holiness of life, holiness in the inward man, sanctify in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, all the rigidity, all the carnality, all the adamant, stony nature, and every sin that is resisting your word and resisting your will. Oh, Lord, I pray that by this experience of sanctification, uproot it from every heart in Jesus' name. Lord, we know there are people who do not believe in holiness, but here, we believe in holiness. 
We believe in following peace with all men. We believe in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We believe blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. We believe those who have clean hands and pure heart, those are the only people that will be on the heel of the Lord on the final day. Lord, we believe do it according to our faith in Jesus' name. Pray, Lord, the sanctification experience, the holiness experience that you give us, that everywhere we go, we take it along with us. When we go to the market, we'll not leave holiness behind. When we go to our offices, we'll not leave holiness behind. When we, come, when we go to commercial places, we'll not leave holiness behind. When we come to minister unto you and unto the people, we'll not leave holiness behind. When we stay on the pulpit, we'll not leave holiness behind. When we come to sing or to serve the, the people of God in any way, we'll not leave peace and holiness behind. Peace and holiness will be a constant companion in Jesus' name. I will pray that until you will come, until the trumpet will sound, this holiness will be a reality in every life. And we pray, Lord, if we're going to assist in the work of the Lord, if we're going to assist in the progress of the gospel, if we're going to assist in bearing the body and sharing the Lord with the Moses, with the leader, with the pastor you have appointed for us in our own church here, we must have the Spirit of God. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you fulfill that promise you said you'll pour your Spirit upon all flesh, upon the sanctified Spirit son and the sanctified daughter upon the sanctified minister the sanctified worker you say you'll pour your spirit upon the sanctified member Lord do as you have said pour out your spirit in Jesus name the Holy Ghost and fire the Holy Ghost and power the Holy Ghost and anointing the Holy Ghost and unction bring upon every one of us in Jesus name when we have the Holy Ghost, prayer becomes easier. We'll pray for my heart. We'll pray everywhere. We'll pray every time. We'll pray without ceasing, Lord. There's this kind of life that gets tired at praying, that tries to stop praying every time we pray in the church, that's trying to stop the prayer of the husband, the prayer of the wife, the prayer of, of believers in our home. Lord, we'll pray that hindering spirit, which is not the Holy Spirit, take it away from us in Jesus' name. The spirit that waits upon the Lord. The spirit that is calling upon the Lord every time. That Lord, every time we're praying, miracles are happening. Every time we're praying, great, great things are happening. We pray it will come upon our lives in Jesus' name. The spirit of the world that is only asking for worldly things, for earthly things, for carnal things, that is seeking all those material things before the kingdom of God. Take that kind of spirit away from us in Jesus' name. And as we seek the kingdom of God, and as we seek your righteousness, we we'll pray, O oh Lord, all the other things will be added. Healing up will be added. Deliverance will be added. Prosperity will be added. Food, bread, butter will be added. Wife, children will be added. And all the other things who have been spending time, we're asking for this, asking for this, and asking and seeking and knocking doors. We pray this year will be the year of addition in Jesus' name. Holiness plus prosperity. Holiness plus bread and butter. Holiness plus new job. Holiness plus marriage. Holiness plus miracle children. Holiness plus deliverance. We pray, Lord, as we have the fruit and the root of holiness and we're grounded in holiness, all the other things without exception will be added in every life in Jesus' name. Pour the spirit of prayer upon every one of us. 
Lord, that spirit of the devil that tries to time prayer in the presence of the Almighty, take that spirit of the devil away from us. The spirit of the Antichrist that tries to hinder prayer. That spirit of the Antichrist that tries to stop prayer when we come to your presence because he wants us poor. He wants us unprovided for. He wants us unrighteous. He wants us powerless. That's why he appoints uh, his people, timekeepers for prayer. Lord, we pray you stop all the activities of the devil in Jesus' name. Spirit of prayer, pour upon us. Spirit of supplication, pour upon us. Spirit of importunate praying, intercession, pour upon us in Jesus' name. Now and henceforth, prayer, power, possibilities in every life. Lord, I pray new life for everyone. Yeah. New power for everyone. Yeah. New unction for everyone. Yeah. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength in your presence and as we go back home. Yeah. Fulfill your will, your word, your promise in every life. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.